って。Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and it's Thursday morning, business in Hawaii. Uh, and we have today Ray Tsuchiyama, an, an old friend and host and guest on Think Tech for many years, um, who has uh, thought about and written about uh, what it's life, what it's like under uh, coronavirus, especially for the the CEOs. How how do they uh, change the way they run their companies? How do they respond to the crisis? So all you CEOs, gather around because this is the kind of conversation we're going to have. Ray, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, uh, Jay, and happy Prince Kuhio Day. Thank you very much for that. Um, so you have a bunch of slides, and I want to allow you the opportunity to go through them and, and present your thoughts, at least initially, uh, and then we'll get into a discussion about it after that. Thank you very much. And we'll start with the first one um, that shows uh, a friend of mine uh, at the ja Honolulu Japanese Chamber of Commerce. But what is really, really significant about this photograph is the words since 1900. And that was the year of the great bubonic plague in Honolulu that led, unfortunately, to the Great Chinatown Fire, which destroyed more than 30 acres in central Honolulu and really resulted in Japanese and other ethnic uh, business people at that time banding together and working to grow the economy of Hawaii uh, uh, after the demonic plague. So again, it, it's a um, indication or a sign that a, a plague or, or epidemic uh, did have outcomes uh, to the to business and economy in Hawaii right there. Just for context, Ray, the bubonic plague was a bacterial plague. It was spread by fleas on rats, as I recall. Um, and it was of great concern in, in the late 19th century, early 20th century in Hawaii. Um, and it was um, one of a number of diseases uh, that, that had decimated uh, the population and economy of the state over the hundred years prior. Um, and uh, it, it was not like coronavirus. It didn't have the same contagion level, but it did kill a lot of people. And the, certainly the business community was very concerned about it. And uh, it led to, as you and I discussed before the show, it led to a kind of rethinking of, uh, of how we deal with um, business enterprises and how we deal with crises along those lines. Please continue. Uh, that's absolutely correct, uh, uh, Jay. And, um, but there were similarities with the bubonic plague outbreak in Honolulu of 1900 and today in 2020. That is to say, the bacillus seem to come from, originated from central China, number one. And it came to uh, Hawaii and also um, infected uh, people uh, randomly, it seemed. And the Board of Health of that time was giving uh, it really uh, broad powers, almost dictatorial powers to quarantine Chinatown. And they were the ones in charge and the pandemic uh, ended five, in five months. Unfortunately, it did uh, result in that fire. But you're absolutely right. In the 19th century, there were smallpox, uh, diphtheria, typhus, cholera, many, uh, many epidemics. And of course, the longest running one that has its own quarantine is Hansen's disease in Kalau Papa. Uh, and sulfur drugs did uh, treat patients that it's okay for them to be in society and back to society. But that's a quarantine that has been around since the mid 19th century, in fact. Uh, yeah, put so, it in so, context. Let's, let, yeah, right. Putting it in context, Ray, you know, if you look at the year 1800 or so, we, we didn't hear in Hawaii, we didn't have a lot of these. We didn't have most of these diseases. We didn't have any of no. these diseases. No. Um, and, you know, Captain Cook and following, they brought them here for us. and. Uh, the Native Hawaiian people you know, suffered throughout the whole century and were decimated in population because of all these various diseases. So by the year 1880 or so, correct me if I'm wrong on the year, uh, the monarchy uh, developed a Department of Health and they were really tired of all these diseases and outbreaks. And so they gave a lot of, you know, 
a lot of people, a lot of resources to that department. And that still exists today. The Department of Health in the state of Hawaii is one of the biggest departments we have. It has thousands of employees. It is proactive. It is, it is on the streets and in the homes. Uh, it occupies the same uh, influence and the same, you know, proactivity and concept uh, that the Department of Health did at the, at the outset. So we, we have to be uh, cognizant of that. And the question ultimately, which I hope we can discuss today, is, uh, you know, has the Department of Health met that standard vis-a-vis -vis planning, preparing uh -huh, for the coronavirus? Anyway, go on, please. Well, let's, let's go on to the first slide in business. We look at uh, the CEO and COVID-19, the first priority for any CEO in the world, in Hawaii, is, of course, the employees of the company. But I also add that the CEO is responsible, has to lead the company to survive. Plus, I think many people, including myself, see the COVID-19 crisis as a time to innovate and have new growth in business and new products. So that, that's, I think, uh, one, my key number one. And for the CEO to really point to health sites or uh, headquarters approved materials, there's a danger for fake news among employees, among families and so forth. You really have to be uh, a leader in looking at the right uh, sources of information, like the CDC, the Hawaii Department of Health, uh, WHO. The other area, the number three, that people have been doing is to divide into micro teams like A, B, C, D, and each one is like a micro company because if one person gets infected or sick in the sales department, the sales department entirely has to quarantine. So you want to have uh, micro groups, uh, teams uh, involving uh, uh, different parts of the company so that you can have survival of the company. Are you saying that even if you didn't have these teams before, the CEO should establish these teams, uh, you know, upon the crisis? That's really uh, what I'm saying. And also that if the CEO has a COO, never travel together, never meet together in this time, so that if the CEO gets sick, the COO can come in as the number one from number two, just like a vice president moving into the presidential uh, role at at the United States federal level. So you're absolutely right. A lot of things that we see uh, with COVID-19 should have been already in planning or in, in um, a contingency mode before such a crisis. You're absolutely right. I wanna go back to your point too for a minute because we've seen that on the national level. Uh, the dissemination of accurate information is critical to responding to any crisis uh, and especially a health crisis. And we've seen that in, in, the, in the national um, national response here we have we've had a lot of uh, inaccuracy and fake news uh, coming from the white house and inconsistencies and, and this is a big problem because you know a crisis by definition a crisis of the community of of the of the of the, of the citizenry of the population it's a crisis of people and so uh, you in order to calm them down in order to get them on board in order to have them take your advice you have to be consistent. So I, I think one of the biggest tools, both on the national level, state level, and of course on the business level, is good information, well communicated. It's a major tool in dealing with any crisis, especially this one, don't you think? Absolutely. And I think the CEO also is a position, where does that right or correct information lie? And and uh, that's where I, I would say, the Chamber of Commerce is stepping up, Honolulu Japanese Chamber, uh, many uh, uh, you know, business associations, traded associations are stepping up to that role also. But you're right that uh, Dr. Fauci is a, a very much a trusted figure uh, in, in uh, the society today. Next slide, please. Candy, candy coating is not acceptable because if you, if you candy coat it, then later on you're going to be found to be uh, inaccurate and then you lose the confidence of, of the community. Yeah. That, that's right. Second slide. Uh, the second slide uh, kind of uh, goes to what does a CEO do to really get the right advice? And I would say leverage uh, your trusted advisors, your board directors, consultants, even retirees who come back 
uh, to fill in roles. Uh, maybe uh, you find at, at, a, at a time of crisis, your uh, uh, sales uh, head is not really uh, achieving or doing at the level that you want. You bring in an interim uh, sales director from one of the retirees, for example. You have to talk to your competitors. What are they doing in all this and in the chamber and other associations? But before you send everybody home, which is what companies are doing right now, you must know what your employees are doing uh, in terms of operations at the company first, but what is the outcome? And can they achieve the same outcome and how do they do it at home? And you bring in IT, of course, and now everybody's buying millions of laptops. And I say, uh, I was talking to a uh, IT uh, professional, he says, oh yeah, laptops are a new toilet paper because uh, uh, people, uh, I'm serious, they're bi uh, buying millions at a time. You can't get them. And we're at the end line of the supply chain from uh, the US, the mainland. Uh, servers, yeah, let's let's buy three servers to you know create more bandwidth or uh, file. Again, it'll take time. And when you send people home, uh, then you're exposing your um, files or servers to all kinds of malware, ransomware, phishing, um, uh, all kinds of things. So uh, you have to be very careful and say, who should get access to? What You have to look at the work, uh, exact work that people do. Do they have to get into your um, server for file do, and, or they can do other types of work uh, at home? So that, that's the key. Don't look at IT first. You have to look at your business first. Yeah, you know, one, one thing is that uh, people think that in a crisis, the, the scammers and the hackers and the, the, the fellows who do mischief uh, on computer security are, are going to join in the community effort, you know, to, to survive. But that's not true. Actually, they come out of the woodwork and, uh, and you have additional security problems of mischievous, mischievous people taking advantage it is kind of a schadenfreude of the misfortune of others. So you can't expect they're going to be good now. They might be worse. So you have to double down on security. You're absolutely right. And you have to have very good training. But I, uh, again, you have to look at how your business works and, and have your employees very, very um, uh, aware of what you just said. Uh, next slide, please. Now, going back to my theme here, Throwing IT at people does not increase productivity. Uh, and there was a very famous MIT research uh, project during the 90s that had the mystery of IT and productivity. Uh, it didn't rise. And then they discovered that you have to change management. You have to change teamwork. You have to change for, especially for millennials in your workforce, OKRs, uh, objectives and key results that you trust the employee that they will meet the objectives in their own time, in their own schedule. And you, there are software available for CEOs to look on, monitor every employee at home and how they're uh, accessing service. Don't do that. You lose your employees because uh, you want to create a very good environment for your employees to be successful. Now, you know, I, I spoke to an IT uh, professional this morning. And uh, of course, they do a lot of um, uh, you know video conferencing these days in order to address these very same things uh, that you have on this slide. And um, what what he said was he was more busy now in trying to put things together along these lines than he ever was before. It's not like he's at home relaxing. Uh, he's under tremendous pressure every day um, to have conferences and get people on board and change the system to be resilient for the crisis. It's very interesting. It's not easy. Again, again, like you said, uh, Jay, in the beginning of the program, if companies had done this already, had a very solid OKRs in place that they could manage and trust employees when they go home to do the work and have outcomes that really contribute to the company, you wouldn't have all this crisis. You see, and it's uh, there would be the crisis, the pandemic crisis, just sets a, sets a light on how companies should do better planning. Next slide, Absolutely. please. Uh, this is the uh, uh, before the final slide, which is an appendix. But um, I would also uh, like to say that companies should 
really um, go forth and, and think and innovate uh, you are not going to do the same things uh, going forward that uh, every uh, B to uh, C customer marketing survey is worthless today. So you have to rethink how are you going to sell to the customer? How are you going to sell to your market? The market has completely changed. And also that IT will be very significant going forward. Uh, it will be even more doubly significant because you have people working at home uh, you know, going forward. And you know, but coming, yeah, go ahead. But you know, in, uh, in so many companies, and maybe Hawaii has a fair share of companies like this, the tension is, uh, you know, why, why change? We've always done it this way, so we should continue to do it this way uh, and resist change of any kind. Um, the thing about the virus and the crisis is it is change. You can't resist it. Um, and you must come up with new ideas to deal with it. So in that sense, it's going to, you know, elicit or require new thinking, uh, which ultimately it's sort of like the, uh, the Airbnb and Groupon uh, phenomenon. Right. That, uh, we find new systems because we have to. Necessity is the mother of invention. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, if if IT is going to be uh, so significant in in the economy going forward, then we also, as a society, as a state, have to look on that uh, look upon computer science in K to twelve at the universities in business as the number one priority going forward in, in, for the state, and that's something that I hope the governor, uh, the mayor, the UH president, and the superintendent of schools are looking at uh, to see to really foster an integrated uh, computer science initiative throughout the society. Yeah, one good example would be education, especially higher education, where, you know, the University of Hawaii has not adopted online courses to, to any significant degree, even though well, we've had uh, MOOCs, uh, you know, on a national level for years. Um, and uh, now we have to do that. The university has to do that. And they're establishing systems and people, students are in fact attending classes and uh, MOOCs type classes uh, to finish the semester. Um, so you know, it's a positive thing and it will outlive the virus. Right. It will outlive the, the, the pandemic. And at the end of the day, we will have more people who know more about how to do online classes and we will do more of them. So that's a positive change. Although in a, in a sea of trouble, it's a positive change. You're correct. So um, uh, even before the, the crisis, a state like Arkansas under its governor uh, really put uh, computer science as a major initiative in K-12, even before the pandemic. So uh, this is an accelerated change for Hawaii. Uh, being isolated, we have to develop uh, a strong workforce in computer science uh, that has a base in K-12 and then have new industries, new products based on um, uh, software development that can we can sell globally and people will enjoy and have better products and, and money, you know, <laughs> through PayPal and other uh, uh, e-commerce to Hawaii. That's what we need, uh, a new economy. Yeah. Please go on. Uh, last uh, slide. So the last slide is uh, quite uh, 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 an appendix. Just that uh, CEOs should be aware that when they send uh, their employees home, that they should have a training session or program that these uh, uh, phishing or, or malware or security issues uh, will be uh, exponentially uh, attacking uh, that uh, employee at home through their Wi-Fi that uh, anybody can hack. So you have to be very careful of how you uh, do uh, uh, IT or emails or accessing uh, the company server, because once a hacker gets into your server, the ransomware could be um, ransom could be 50, 100, 200,000, maybe millions of dollars just to restore your files back to a company. Yeah, I'm reminded of that shipping company in Europe, uh, Scandinavian shipping company that was hacked and uh, 
they had a terrible time. They were down and all their shipping stopped for a while. Um, and they were only only moder moderately prepared for it. This is maybe three years ago. But let me let me say that, uh, you know, what this all evokes for me is that um, there, there's no room for a Luddite uh, in the CEO job or in the COO job in a, in a, in a company today, anywhere in this country and, and probably the world. Um, and this is going to separate the men from the boys, the women from the girls. Uh, and, and a CEO who doesn't follow this kind of thinking, a CEO who doesn't you know, respond to the virus and make the changes necessary to deal with it, who doesn't come out the other side with better systems, is a CEO who may very well lose his job in the process of the crisis. Uh, this is not a drill. The CEO must respond and he must take your advice, Ray. You must feel like a very important person. <laughs> well, I'm trying to help the community uh, because the, uh, we have a landscape of small to medium businesses, many family businesses that uh, the CEO's uh, father or grandparents established uh, since before statehood or just before uh, afterwards. They're in their own building that they own. They're thinking of selling their own building or uh, other income producing properties. It, it is a very crisis time uh, for a lot of small businesses and they have a product that sold well in the pre COVID-19 economy to local people or exclusively to tourists. There are no tourists here. And local people are, uh, like me, sequestered in their homes. We're not going to malls or uh, going to these uh, small shops. So uh, you're right. It, it, I, I think that I hope these little advice or guidelines will help CEOs really develop the right mindset first, the right planning, and they can uh, retain their great core employees because that's the heart of our community. Yeah, and, and self-reliance is really a, a central part of that, a concept of self-reliance around the state. You and I were talking about it before the show, and, and we, we are not self-reliant, although there have been governors in the past, uh, I'm thinking of John Burns, who, who spoke to that, and, and George Ariyoshi, and maybe others too, but uh, we have not achieved self-reliance, not in agriculture, um, not in, in diversification. And I recall one, uh, one appearance at the Hawaii Venture Capital Association, where a young programmer uh, stood up and he complained. He said, you know, the, these big institutions in tourism uh, go to the mainland <clears throat> for their software development. But we have developers here, we have programmers here. Why don't, and we know as much about tourism, for example, as anyone in the world. We have the expertise in, in an operational sense. We should become more self-reliant and use our own people and develop systems. And it's not just software, it's everything. We have to learn to have the self-reliance of an island state, an island economy. And this epidemic is, I think it's going to show us we don't have that self-reliance and we better change our view of the matter. What do you think? Well, uh, as early as uh, five years after statehood, Governor Burns said he desired, quote, a Hawaii economy based on research, unquote. And that's barely in the 60s. Uh, he envisioned, and many others uh, uh, envisioned also uh, the University of Hawaii as an engine of economic growth. Uh, again, not another thing that we should go back to, it is becomes even more significant. That is a con one research university on the island in Hawaii. We have to leverage that. Bishop Street and UH has to partner for the future. So I have a tough question for you, Ray. So we're talking about CEOs, talking about doing the right thing. We're talking about self-reliance, uh, seeing the state as a, a place where we can and should develop self-reliance. But you know, since statehood, since you and I have you know seen the state develop, a lot of a lot of capital concentrations in this state have been acquired by mainland mainland firms, uh, mainland investors, mainland controlling interests. Um, so the CEO doesn't necessarily work for. He's not necessarily oriented to. Um, you know, the, the local market, the local concern, the local need for self-reliance. He's taking instructions from somebody in L.A. who owns his company. What do you say to him about all this? Well, again, the number one um, priority is the local employees. He or she has to look 
after the employees. That's that's the uh, really the responsibility. I feel the leadership here uh, right now, right now. But going forward, uh, you're correct that uh, it's it's um, uh, aligning what you have in resources, and we've always been capital poor. You're absolutely right. Capital has to come here from Japan or mainland or whatever. And that's something that we really have to work on, uh, be self-reliant and work with less uh, leverage of uh, uh, resources, the uh, you know, limited resources we have here in, in much more quantif- uh, much more ways that we really need really to think of. Uh, being like Singapore, they're in the middle of nowhere, but really leveraged language and entrepreneurship and trading, uh, trading to attract uh, uh, companies to come there and then develop their own capital and then start pe- send people out to sell things and market uh, glo- uh, uh, commerce globally. So there are you know, other models we can look at. But uh, right now, you're right, we're, we're beholden to the swing, upswings and downswings of Wall Street to the stock market and, and uh, investors in, in companies in Hawaii or throughout the world. Well, one last question, Ray, and, and that is, um, I'd like to know your your feeling about this, um, either optimism or pessimism, about how well we're going to do, how well our companies are going to do, not only during the crisis, but, but after, hopefully soon, after the crisis is, has been ameliorated or has uh, you know been minimized somehow. Um, are you pessimistic? Are you optimistic? Uh, what's your thought going forward? How do you feel about it? I feel that uh, CEOs are working very hard right now, ultra hard. That's that's number one. Uh, looking, but I think the future will depend how bright it is, how rosy it is, or how complicated it is, on how CEOs look at this phase, which is just about survival for the next six months, and beyond that how to innovate and seek new ways of growth. We're talking about growth. How do you grow? How do you restore 40 to 60,000 lost jobs uh, right now in the hotel industry? How do you, uh, you know, recover that into new growth areas uh, throughout the state? That is a unbelievable uh, task. And I think we need a lot more alliances, a lot more partnerships, uh, in, in society to move this forward in innovative ways three, five years from now, we may have a completely uh, different economy. But again, uh, it depends on how people can innovate. Ray Tsuchiyama, host uh, and often a guest on Think Tech Hawaii, um, business counselor, uh, tech counselor, uh, par excellence. Uh, so great to be able to talk to you, Ray. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And thank you again, and uh, let's uh, move forward in the spirit of Prince Kuhio, King Kalakaua, and other leaders of Hawaii. Stay safe, Ray. Aloha.